Um, so welcome to the Southern Oregon Family Farms Cooperative uh, General Meeting. Uh, we we ha do have an agenda. Typically how we start is we'll introduce, briefly introduce the co-op, uh, talk about it and what it's here for and, and um, the benefits of being part of the co-op. Then we'll do a quick 30 second per person farm member um, uh, introduction, <laughs> which there's not a whole bunch of us uh, right now. So that should be pretty quick. And then we'll switch over to Andrew, who at this time is a uh, returning uh, uh, guest. And then we'll hear from Adrian. You guys get a little bit more time to talk about yourselves. Um, hey, Christine, would you would you be would you care to introduce the co-op, or do you want me to? Can you please? Sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, so Southern Family Farms is. Uh, is a Oregon registered uh, agricultural cooperative. And we signed the documents on June 20th, uh, which was, has it been uh, like about four and a half months ago, that is. And we have done, from my perspective, incredible work moving forward with um, getting organized, um, kind of learning about what the farm members value and and what the and what the industry needs um we've also been able to acquire a lot of support from the community and as we get continue to become organized uh, more and more people are starting to warm up to the idea and um, thanks to green like law group we have also learned what the potential there is for the cooperative um, and maybe you'll hear a little bit more about that as well in the coming months for those of you who are attending the meetings and or, or watching the videos that we put out on a weekly basis. Uh, but essentially, the Southern Oregon Family Farms was a response to a need from um, the small craft farmers to come together and to start uh, creating direct to sale channels to dispensaries uh, versus uh, to, to going through the typical wholesale uh, outlet, which I don't want to say, except for present company, uh, Jeremy, of course. Um, so a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the farmers had a lot of trouble with some of the established wholesalers. And as prices have tightened, they have uh, felt real pain and the wholesalers just made that a lot worse. Um, just uh, Tuesday at our board meeting, we heard of one of our members had uh, an astronomical amount of um, product on the shelves at a wholesaler and it wasn't climate control and it all went bad. And that was something that has been repeated over and over and over again. So at this point with the state of an industry, the cooperative has been created to help help the industry survive. With that said, though, there is the opportunity, especially after interstate commerce, for the co-op to become a national recognized organization. And if we continue to move forward in the way we're doing it, there, I am confident that we will end up with a market share in the national on the national platform once interstate commerce. Uh, so right now it's about survival, but there is a big opportunity for thriving as an organization. And so um, I'm happy to be on the ground floor of that. So with that said, um, I'd like to go ahead and um, give Brian the opportunity to introduce himself and his farm. Let's keep it to 30 seconds if we can for our farm members. Cool. I'm Brian Neestrath, owner, uh, co-owner of Green Bandit, and my wife and I run the business together. We are located near Eagle Point, um, and we grow in the ground. We focus on regenerative farming techniques, and we recently actually uh, did an inspection with Sun and Earth to be certified, which is a sort of a cannabis uh, organic certifier. So we're excited about that. And, um, yeah, we just focus on producing a really good product. We are uh, attentive to what we're doing, just like the rest of the people here, and we take a lot of pride in it. And that's us. All right, Christine, you want to introduce your farm? 
Hello, I'm Christine Miller um, of Southern Oregon Moonshine. I'm a second generation cannabis farmer here in Southern Oregon, and um, I have a outdoor sun grown full season tier two um, with a focus on sustainability and providing clean plant medicine. All right, and Devin? Hi, everybody. I'm Devin, Circle D Farms. Uh, me and Christine grow on the same property. We have the same growing practices, uh, tier two, sun grown. Awesome. And uh, Mark? Hey, I'm Mark Lapalia with Alta Gardens. Uh, we plant straight into the ground and uh, we got some BHO out and yeah, we're just doing uh, organic outdoor and focusing only organic. We're never going to go anything besides quality. Getting people high is what we do. So <laughs> nice. Uh, Patrick. Hey guys, this is Patrick Butch with Roganja, um, co owner with my brother. And here too, Ground Eagle Point, working with um, trying to get the Sun and Earth certification right now as well. Personally, just tired of kind of working as a charity and while the dispensaries and stuff make money, um, I want to make money like everybody else. <laughs> anyway, that's me and hopefully the co-op can, uh, we can grow this. All right, um, and Rhea. Hey guys, Rhea Miller from Millerville Farms. My husband, Matt, and I own and operate our farm in Tacoma, Oregon, all sun-grown, uh, full-term, and uh, some hand-pulled light up. Right on. And I'll introduce myself. I'm not a farm member, but I'm on the board and founder. Uh, Justin Botier, CEO of Calix CPAs in Medford, Oregon been in uh, providing uh, business advisory tax and uh, tax planning services for the industry since 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, when it became recreationally illegal, my uh, office blew up and I have in turn, uh, I have not, uh, uh, what, what's the expression? I, I, I'm losing it, but anyway, I've been really enjoying it. Um, it's difficult, I'm with, uh, I am affected by the industry in its ups and its downs, just like everybody else. And so um, I'm also needing the industry to, to thrive so that I could also thrive. And, um, you know, the, the kind of work that we do is 280E mitigation. Um, we work with a lot of nested businesses. We, we do work with dispensaries, chains, and those kinds of things. Um, but I do appreciate working with farmers the most. So anyway, that's me. Um, let's see here. Applicant Alan Clark. He's on the call today. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Clark. I own Nightwood Horticulture Limited. Uh, we are um, regenerative, organic, tier two farm on the coast out in Coos County, um, you know, third generation cannabis farmer. And um, yeah, pretty much in line with everything that everybody else is saying, uh, looking to make money and, um, you know, find other like minds to, you know, build our practice with and, you know, bounce ideas off of to create, you know, just the best medicine that we can. Right on. Um, and returning guest, Jeremy. Daddy. Good morning. I'm, I'm here to help answer any questions as far as distribution. Um, I currently distribute for uh, a few of the farms that are on here, but I've got to be careful not to take on too many at once. I'm listening to all the complaints and, and concerns with distribution, and it's helping me a lot to make sure we do it correctly. I've learned a lot from Christine and Devin on on what would be a great distribution. And I try to do, I try to do the right thing for the farm and bring the farm and the dispensaries together. So thanks for having me. I'm learning a lot here. All right, right on. And um, returning guest, Andrew DeWeese. Hey, I'm Andrew, I'm a partner at Greenlight. Um, we had attorney for a long time. Um, I'm generally a litigator, um, generally get called when 
uh, something really goes wrong. Um, but the my partners do um, real estate work and uh, and and corporate work as well. well we we try to be full service for the industry. Um, here, uh, because I support the um, uh, craft cannabis movement, um, and I've been advocating for a while for people to uh, people in your position to uh, join a co-op to form a co-op um, for your own protection and uh, and looking towards federal legalization and how we can keep the uh, local Oregon ownership uh, of, of small farms. Um, alive in in the model as as we expand to uh, federal level. Right on, right on. And then we've got um, a new guest, um, Adrian Malmitas. Malmitas. Malamitas. That's Malamitas. a tough one. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Take your time. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Take your time. Let us know a little bit about you. Sure. C can you hear me all right? I sure can. We should. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah, my name is uh, Adrian Malamitsis. Um, I'm uh, relatively new to the industry. Uh, I'm the owner of Blue and Yellow Farm. Um, I got my uh, my license back in 2019 and moved to the state of Oregon to to do this um, from Arizona. So it's definitely been a little bit of a roller coaster um, to to you know be here, do this, try to you know manage everything manage everything that I need to manage. Uh, but it, luckily I've met good, good guys like Brian that have kind of helped me out along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. I, I, I'm still go to work with a smile. I, I love the state of Oregon, love being here and really excited about this uh, organization to kind of, you know, pull together and, and, um, and make some, some, you know, keep making some really awesome quality product and, and selling it as a whole, you know, that's it. What uh, what size is it a tier two uh, license that you got or? Yeah, what? I'm sorry, I'm I'm a tier two. I'm sun grown outdoor, right in you know organic soil, you know right in the soil, and uh, um, yeah, yeah, just uh, just love the uh, love growing that way. That love this, you know the, the the product that comes out of it, and yeah, I think this is a great state and area to be in to do that. Right on, right on. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, we don't have a whole lot on the agenda. I was thinking that we could go over, um, last week we, we went over some of the board initiatives um, and uh, Tuesday we had our board meeting and we were able to secure people to be on the new board position. So we voted on having 11 established board positions. Um, the five main uh, president, vice president, secretary, um, treasurer, and we included uh, um, sergeant of arms. And then we have five committee uh, business, or I guess you would call them board of directors, but each one of those directors would be a committee chair. Um, and uh, I put out an email to do, because we kind of ran out of time, I put out an email to uh, for us to vote on those and just as as volunteered. So we had at least nine of those positions filled uh, by people who are volunteering to be on those positions. And I sent out an email to do kind of like an email vote on whether or not we wanted to go. Everybody was good with that. The consensus so far is that everybody is good. There hasn't been any nays or any other additional requests for uh, introduction. So what I was kind of thinking is maybe we can kind of go down the line and um, talk about the committees. And I know, um, Brian, you had some ideas that you had set my way to discuss um, some strategies on filling those committees as well. And so um, I thought we would go ahead and talk about that. But let me backpedal a little bit. One of the things I've been really liking that we're doing in these general meetings is we do like a little state of the uh, state of the market update. Um, last week we did it at kind of towards the end, but I'm kind of thinking that we probably should devote a little bit of time each meeting to talk about that and just kind of get the get some ideas of what is happening in the industry from the actual experiences that the farm members are having or the guests. Um, uh, at our board meeting, um, one of our uh, members uh, 
talked about, he had a little bit of doom and gloom to say, but then previous to that, we had the meeting before that, we had some positive news. So it'd be kind of good to maybe hear that. And Christine's on the phone now, but maybe I'll just open it up for everybody to, to put in their two cents if anybody wants to talk about any wins they may have had in the industry. Sarah's on the road today making sales. Um, she's selling our 21 product um, at a very low price for B buds and A flower and pre rolls, but it's just kind of clearing out inventory and creating space for us and recovering money that we've already spent. So, um, so she's out making sales. Uh, I just a thought that's rattling around in my head today, and this is kind of well, I'm thinking about the the circular manifest that she's on. And the fact that those manifests are limited to 25 pounds is just, it's just choking us so hard. And so I think while everybody's here, particularly like Jeremy, you're a wholesale guy, Andrew, you're a legal professional. Um, this is something that just needs to be addressed. I, I can't see any reason why we're limited to 25 pounds. And she literally had to hold four pounds off of her deliveries to, on this trip because she couldn't make it work she was over 25 pounds and like you know in this time when it's so tough to get things done in fact i also am curious for for jeremy the wholesaler like does a wholesale license also have a limit on 25 pounds for uh for a circular manifest it does and and what we've done there is put some stuff on an order to a dispensary if you think they're gonna take it you can put that on your order and then also have your circular. So I can put 20 pounds on an order for a dispensary that I've got a relationship with, or I think they're gonna take most of it. They can reject it, right? But, and then also have your circular. So if there's anybody out there that they're expecting, you're expecting them to buy something, put it on an order to them and take it off your circular. That way you can take more product out there. But yes, it's a constant headache on so how we're limited. Um, and man, maybe we have read it wrong in the law, but what Sarah had uncovered was that it says you can't have any more than 25 pounds in the vehicle on a circular manifest. And so the circular itself is limited to 25, but also the vehicle is limited to 25. That's what we read. I don't maybe believe so, but I would re refer to the, the, the law we, guys in here, but that's not the way we're doing it. And we've done it a lot where we've had van loads with previous, okay. my previous employers, I mean, trailer loads of product going yeah. out, but just the circular is limited to the 25 pounds and 60 hours. Now, the rest of the stuff, if it's an order, it has to be back. You can't have it out there for 60 hours. Ah, uh, there that it might is. be part of it. Yeah. Yeah. She's going to be gone for two days now on this trip. She's doing Portland, Bend, all kinds of stuff. And so, um, but yeah, that, that's just been a constant bugger. And I really think that it will pay for all of us to be sending emails to the OLCC, to the OCA, to whoever you can, who has these communications. What's up, Christine? I actually um, was talking to somebody from OCA yesterday and they suggested that the co-op get a membership to the OCA. Yeah, sounds good. They're really receptive. And um, I thought that was a great idea. I was like, yeah, let's do that. Like I have a membership, I think to OCA and the ORCA or CIA, whatever it is now, because we have maps account and you have to, you have to, <laughs> but it yeah. would be cool for the co-op to get a membership and then attend their, most of their meetings are in Portland, but they're going to try to do them through zoom. And then we can address these things. And then um, ORCA or CIA seems to, take a lot of like these kind of like um when there's open comments commenting like they they'll either you we can email them and they'll submit the questions on our behalf or we can like call or email directly to with these concerns but i think getting a membership for the cia and the oca would probably be a really good idea for the co-op yeah then we have a we have a, a pretty loud voice because it's coming from a bunch of members all at once mm -hmm. um so my phone's doing Guys, if I, could, if I could break in for one second, because this is apropos of what Christine just said. 
Um, I had a, a meeting on Monday with Amy Margolis, who is the new head of the OCA, and I told her about the co-op, and she is really, really interested in meeting with you guys and getting you guys into the fold. Um, she, she even said that, that they, are, they are reconstituting the regional committees, and she thinks it might be a great idea to have someone from the co-op be the head of the Southern Oregon Regional Committee. Uh, so there, there's real interest there um, uh, on, on an organizational level. And, and I think Amy personally um, really has an interest in seeing Southern Oregon craft cannabis cultivators succeed. Um, I, I agree with a lot of her uh, philosophy regarding, um, you know, not kowtowing to law enforcement um, uh, really um, her, her philosophy behind building the industry is, is taking away regulations, right? And, and making it so that people like us can compete. Uh, people like, like you guys can compete better because you're just not constrained by these stupid regulations that, you know, don't allow you to, you know, uh, have more than 25 pounds in your van while you're trying to make sales all over the state. So, I'd encourage, um, and maybe we can talk offline about this, or I don't know, get her to one of these meetings. I'd really encourage us to interface with the OCA um, because I think they can help and they want to help. Yeah, Andrew, we're, we're doing, uh, if you wouldn't mind um, doing an email introduction, that would be great. I can add her to the list. The best thing I think anybody could do is just be here for these meetings. If they are an ancillary business and they want to talk about what they're doing um, or they represent an organization want to talk about they're doing, they get the floor. Um, and so hey guys, this, this is this is Rhea. And uh, after Christine and I met with our uh, OCA uh, board member liaisons up in Portland yesterday, Amy reached out directly to me. So I'd be happy to make that introduction. She reached out and wanted to talk. Excellent. Um, yeah. And uh, just, I wanted to just jump back to market update really quick because yeah. um, I'm driving and I'm not sure. I'm heading into the hills here on I-5, so I'm not sure how long I'll have service. Uh, but Jesse Bonacu is the ex executive director of the CIA previously, ORCA. Um, we met with him and uh, Casey and the other members of CIA in Portland for their quarterly meeting. Uh, the uh, OLC theme. Uh, regarding numbers, you've been watching the harvest, what weights uh, throughout the season uh, this summer there, or this year in general, there's been a, a significant increase in harvest wet weights for uh, outdoor farms in uh, curiously new months. Um, but what I have from him from an email from yesterday um, is just a quick update on uh, October harvest data. Uh, saying that it's been posted and that it's looking to be a positive trend for farms. As compared to last year, the total October harvest, this is wet weight, is down 26%, about one and a half million pounds. Uh, outdoor is down 28%, mix is down 21%, and indoor is down 7%. These harvest numbers are only a 3% increase over 2020 October harvest, but they do represent 39% increase over 2019. He says as long as there's not a bunch of people harvesting more stuff right now, as in November, that it's looking encouraging. Um, nice. The words work for me, but I requested the actual spreadsheet just because I want to analyze it a little bit better because he sa says that um, Hey, Rhea, anyway, I wasn't uh, able to write. I wasn't able to write all that down. Well, I guess I've got this recorded. What am I talking about? I can write it down later. Forward it to you. I'd be happy to forward it to you and I'll. Yeah, um, yeah I want to be able to get that out to everybody. I should be getting the spreadsheet. I actually have, we, we share a Google Drive, so I have access to the full year's harvest numbers and with comparison uh, year after year. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull that up. But, um, says that uh, for retail sales, the numbers are still a little rough, but total sales are down 15% from last October, but that that's still an improvement over the average 18% decline in 
until August. But then on a positive side, a total volume of flour, pre-rolled and usable marijuana sold was up 7% over last October. He says that he'll spend some more data, some more time with it and uh, let me know when he gets a chance to, to do some more as well. Um, but that's my market update for you from Jesse Bonfield. Nice. Any any good news is welcome. Sounds pretty positive to me. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I mean, that's what he's at a three percent increase overall from twenty nineteen or twenty twenty. Twenty. That's what I heard. I mean, 2020 is a glut, though, right? I guess there's less sun grown. Patrick, you got your hand up. I thought maybe we could just go around real fast and say, like, uh, we don't have many pounds left, but we're selling them for 400 bucks a pound right now just to get rid of them. And if maybe uh, everyone could just kind of want to, if they want to volunteer that information or not and what Jeremy, what you're seeing out there on the market. So yeah, we're selling like mainly joints and stuff, but, and we have been selling our pounds that we said we would never go below 500, but now we're at 400. So that's that. This is 2022 or 2021? 2021, we're not getting to the 2022 for another month or so. And that's yeah. pre-rolls pre -rolls and pre-rolls too? Pre rolls we sell yes a good amount of but the pounds I guess I was curious on the pounds um, the pre roll price has been going down a little bit as well as more people would jump in and gets more competitive I guess but uh, I can I can give some insight on what we're doing I've got pounds as low as one hundred and fifty dollars uh, people wanting to get rid of last year's or last year's product to make room for the new harvest which is horrible. But I'm also getting calls that from dispensaries that they're buying it for $75 a pound. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous out there, just like last year, except for the buyers aren't buying as much as they did last year when it's those crazy deals because they got stuck with it last year. So even though the prices are down, they're not buying in the quantities that they did last year. And um, I've got last year's pre-rolls dollar grams and dupe tubes. I got thousands of them. And there's, there's some farms out there that didn't sell anything. I mean, they're still sitting on a ton of the weight that they had and they've one, they've got to make room Two, they need some sort of revenue for this year's harvest. So it's, it's a, still a bloodbath out there from what I'm seeing. Um, and then I've got everything in between that and the indoor. So it's, I, I also think that with those numbers just reported, I've got people saying, hey, I want to sell it cheap and sell it fast this year. And, and in my opinion, they're going to come to the end of the year and man, I wish it wouldn't have done that. People are running out. There's a lot less people harvested, but there's no crystal ball. Do you want to be upset because you sold all of it for too cheap or <laughs> upset because you had your price too high and still have some? I, it's, a tough, it's a tough deal out there for everyone. And then also there's, when you're driving around Southern Oregon, there's a lot less of the hemp fields. I think that's gonna play a big factor in running out. Yeah, <clears throat> we, we sold most of our weed this year uh, between 350 and 400. And that goes way back, not just to like when things got really tight and difficult, but I saw it coming, right? I saw that I have a lot of, product you know when we got to i don't know may started to be a little bit concerned you know because i'm like man we we haven't moved much so we we didn't want to get caught with a whole lot of product and selling weed for 350 bucks a pound is no way to make a living and we're here we're still in business but but like you know we don't have any like safety net at this point financially 
And it's just because of that. Normally we would sell all of our product and at least have some money sitting there that kind of protects us for a rainy day. So 350, I don't see as sustainable. 400 is hardly sustainable. But, um, but yeah, we, we kind of made the decision early in the year to just suck it up and go for it, get rid of things as, as low as we could and um <clears throat> or as low as we had to to make them move at a clip that was reasonable and it did work to the effect that i don't have very many pounds left of tested product or even a flower maybe maybe 50 pounds total now so it worked but it hurts um but that's kind of the game we played we saw the writing on the wall very early this year we said man this is going to be brutal so what are people selling 2021 product now for like in the last uh, few weeks, two to three weeks? Has there been any movement in 2021? Patrick said 400. I remember for a while it was just totally bare. Uh, but what are we talking about now? Is 2021 still moving in our group? I think Sarah's getting 300 and 350 for the pounds that she's taking. And the bee buds are doing 150. Uh, Pre-packaged bee buds, I'm getting 200, but that's really just covering the cost of the packaging. So we're seeing the same thing as Brian. It's that 350, 300 for some smelly wumbo. Yeah, so it's just like what we can get and like nothing else, and we're just trying. We had, I think we have 15 pounds left though, so we're good. Yeah, cool. Seeing the same exact numbers as Brian is 350, 300, and 150, 100 for bees. And but Scott sold some of his fresh 2022 for 800, mm -hmm. and um, that was for like some of the trendier strains. And he sold like his Hindu, which is like Southern Oregon staple, for 500. Um, but his wholesaler did say that he thinks it's because not many people have come to market with fresh yet, and he thinks that there will be like a rush, kind of like Jeremy was talking about, like everybody who like me and maybe Patrick and every, like everybody else here is like, fuck that. I'm not selling my weed for that price. And we waited all year. And now we're like, uh, <laughs> um, they're going to, they're getting like, um, they're going to sell their weed for really cheap, really fast. And I hope I'm not going to be that person and that I'm going to wait <laughs> and we're going to try to get like five or six back to us just because those are like sustainable prices. Like those are running your business prices, like, like growing another year prices and I can't afford another bankruptcy or like all my savings are gone from not selling this year. So anyways. my, my experience, like from talking to my clients and whatnot, is it seems like all those people that are selling their product for like 150 and seven, you know, 150, 75, yada, yada. They're a lot of them are not returning. I mean, I've had a, an abundance of people just not growing for 2022. Um, and, and is not harvesting their licenses, their land are up for sale. They've either, they've just cut back. If they've had multiple licenses, they cut back. So I think like we're going to see more of the same trend that Rhea was um, describing. And with that, I hope that that six, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a pound um, stays. And that'd be really nice. So let's go ahead and, and move on. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was, and especially while we have guests in, uh, but for, I mean, I do want to give people the opportunity. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, so um, w with the last meeting, uh, everyone was talking about when they were going to potentially bring their flowers to market. How do we make sure, you know, with, you know, the several thousands of pounds that everyone's grown of quality medicine you know last meeting everyone was like i'll probably go to market january or february so if we all go to the market at the same time how are we not stepping on each other that well, is a great question oh brian go ahead you seemed poised yeah just playing into what you were talking about christine and and to to answer that question alan um <clears throat> we have some early varieties i'm imagining that we all do and uh, yeah, I would like to let things cure a little longer and this and that, but I'm looking to have weed available by December 1st. Last year, I waited till January 1st to get going. And I feel like it left us um, kind of out of the minds of the buyers. And it was very hard to pick up and get going in January. And so I'm taking my early stuff. I've already got people bucking down some flour that, you know, dried for 10 days. 
and it's been in totes for another week or two since then and or three weeks really so we've got a cure on it and uh but yeah we're going to go january december 1st a month earlier and then i also think that maybe a silver lining to how hard it's been is that we are all currently selling and we're all currently probably in dispensaries where when january 1st came along last year I wasn't in any dispensaries because I had sold all my weed months before that. So we kind of were starting from zero again. And so I, I think that, you know, the fact that Sarah's out selling today, it bodes well for us to get going into 22. Patrick, you I got think that's a up. really, Oh, sorry. Yeah. I would just say real fast, as far as like not flooding the market all at once, like <clears throat> it's tough, but um, like, what we've done in the past is we don't trim all of our product for, you know, we'll come out with like six strains, sell that out and then move on. And that's also another way of like not getting, you know, not going too much out there with all the trimming costs and recouping some of that cost. Like don't overdo it, you know, just take, take what you can. And you know, you're comfortable if you don't sell that, that you still have money to operate, but not coming to the market all of a sudden with like 2000 pounds and being like, Oh shit, I need to get rid of it. Yeah, we do. We think the same way. Just trim it as we as we have sales going out. So as our inventory gets lower, then we go back to trim. And I like to have as many varieties available as I can. But uh, we're never sitting on a big glut of weed that's trimmed and ready to go uh, because the cost of trimming is real. And so we just don't uh, jump out there and trim it all and then flip the bill for that in advance of sales. That was awesome, you guys. Uh, Christine. I wanted to, yeah, with the same, I've, I've been that person that literally just trims every single pound, has it ready, because I had, like, it was being sold until, like, last year, and then I was an idiot, and I trimmed everything this 2021, and I'm broke, and so um, this year, we're going to do it a little bit slower, but one thing that we could do to not compete against each other, work with each other, is having conversations like this and setting a bottom price and saying, hey, we're all gonna sell our A bud at 600 and let's our 700, like the, the lowest will take back to us. So that's you have to add your commissions on stuff on top of that with your distribution network or costs of distribution. And then um, we can have meetings like this where we say, hey, I'm moving like one pound a month at 600. It's not, that's not the target market. We need to come down or, hey, it's moving a little too fast at 600 let's take it to 650. And if we communicate together and talk together and try to pr like shore up our prices, not even though like we're not maybe distributing at this very second together, because it's just not a sound business plan right now, sharing market data and keeping our prices. So we're not competing with each other would be, I think, helpful. Great. That's great suggestions. That's like the purpose of the co-op right there, that kind of information. Um, what do we think the price should be, guys? Uh, I mean, we're kind of getting there where we're going to start having that conversation. Personally, I, I, I love 600 bucks a pound, but I think that 500 bucks a pound is a, a reasonable floor to really fight for. And, uh, you know, you, you just might walk away from fewer deals at 500, but I think it's six. Some people are going to just tell us to, sorry, I'll just take it from the other guy who's not SOFF, who's not all this and that. But uh, anyway, I think it's good for everybody to think about. I've definitely considered it. And quite honestly, like we've sold much of our weed in the history of our business for less than 500 bucks a pound. Um, and it's not like for me, 450, a dollar a gram. Is kind of like what I see as the floor where I'm still making money. It's not, again, like it's not um, really lucrative, but we can turn a profit and keep going. But 500 bucks a pound puts me into a place where I, where we feel pretty good. And then of course we can, you can go, you can shoot for the stars. You know, if the floor is 500, you can shoot for seven, eight. No, no one's going to gawk at that at the effort. So anyway, and um, maintaining our quality control, like we're all craft cannabis, we all take a lot of pride in what we do. And I think a lot of the trend for people selling cheaper weed is just like, fat, like machine running it and throwing it in a bag and saving the cost of that. 
but then it kind of comes back to bite like we're then that gives sun grown outdoor small farmers kind of a shitty name because the indoors getting the better price and they're hand trimming it or at least hand finishing it and doing that good presentation but a lot of those 75 and 100 dollar pounds are nasty like probably they're not they're not quality that that they're competing with our three hundred fifty dollars, so we are getting more because our product is nicer. So that's we should think about that too. Is like there's people that selling for seventy five and one hundred for a bud, but their weeds shit, and we're not getting very much for our good, lovingly curated, handcrafted weed, but we are getting more. So as if we keep our quality, do low and slow, communicate. I think I think we'll be okay. Hopefully, <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's important to realize that there's so many dispensaries out there that this group, I don't believe would be stepping on each other's toes, but that's where the distribution comes in when you have the reach over the whole state. Now, if everybody's just driving up and down I-5, it's a very saturated market. And that's where you get the competitive pricing and everybody else that's desperate that's dumping their weight. If you, if you can spread yourself out throughout the state, there's so many dispensaries out there, you just got to be able to get to them. And that's where having multiple salespeople that are scattered out through the state and then that distribution process, that's where you can win on that. But if you're hitting all the same stores, those guys are getting the great deals. And to Kristen, Christine's point, the quality matters. It does. When you hand out something that smells like last year's flower, it's, it's hard to sell for the dispensary to sell, right? It's the bum weed. But when you cure it and store it properly, you can still get your money back out of it. I, I do believe that. Right on. Um, do you, do you, uh, Mark had raised, Mark, go for it. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say my like, uh, we're using BHO and pre-rolls to really bridge the gap and so that we're not flooding anything. Like we've tried to sell hundred pounds a month for the whole year. Uh, just because we had it and obviously it doesn't work but uh, now we're even going to like say that it's limited say that this is this and that this is all that's going to be available until x amount of time and that's how we're going to run it because uh, the bho and the pre-rolls just keep the doors open at least and then we're actually being like exclusive sun grown you know like this is 700 is what we're expecting as our like mean but we also found some portland guys that are saying six to seven for fresh wheat is a great price. And, you know, five is like the bulk price at their point. So it's pretty good for the start of the year, but that's what we're hearing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of thinking we should probably create the committees and um, the sales committee should uh, come up with what they think the floor price should be. And then uh, maybe bring that to the board, something like that. Um, but that's one of the things I wanted to do. We, we have about 10 minutes before some of us might have to get off. Um, I could stay out, hang out a little bit longer, but, um, I was hoping that we could just take some time and, and to kind of introduce the committees, what the committees are going to be responsible for. And then, um, that way we can, and then who is now the committee chair for those committees, um, just kind of introduce that idea. Um, so so with that said, are, are you guys on board with taking this meeting that direction or is there anything else that you feel needs to be said? All right, cool. So um, we've got our, uh, Noah, Noah uh, emailed me, said he couldn't make the meeting today, but he volunteered to be, Noah Levine with Benson Arbor uh, volunteered to be the sales committee chair. Um, and, but then also Brian emailed me, said that he had some ideas. He, uh, Brian is now the head of the Paxian pr product placement chair. Now, I'm not sure, those are just names that I came up with um, to describe the kind of uh, initiative that they're addressing, but the name could be anything we want it to be. But essentially, from my perspective, what it's do, what they're doing is coming up with the packaging uh, component. And he was suggesting, and Brian, you could probably talk for yourself, but that the since we don't have so many people to have three plus people on each chair, there's going to be people on the board who are going to have to serve on various 
committees to round out the committees. And he was suggesting that if you are say like the marketing, the chair, the sales chair, and maybe the packaging chair or the or the third part, uh, the grading chair would all kind of serve on the same committees and meet at the same time. One of the things we were talking about, I'm gonna go back now a little bit. One of the things we talked about at our last board meeting is to stagger the meetings because right now we're meeting twice a month and we're doing a board meeting on two, or not twice a week, we're meeting twice a week. Tuesdays we do a board meeting, Thursdays we do the general meeting. And what we're thinking about is now making the board and the general meeting um, every other week. And then the in-between weeks would be used to meet, the committees will meet um, and then bring the uh, initiatives and the news back to the board. And then the board can then like determine what we're gonna bring to the public. And then it'll be brought to the public in the general meeting. Um, I think that's going to work really well. And so um, with that said, we're going to want to have the groups like one of the one of the meetings is board and policy development. Of course, board and policy development doesn't necessarily need to work with the sales committee. Right. So, oh, Andrew, see you later. Oh, we missed. He, he's gone. Um, so. Does anybody have any feedback in what I just said? Um, I can add to what, or I can just spell out what I was, what I was yes, talking about. Um, yeah, just because the math tells me that um, we don't have enough people to be committee members and, and not to be just chair members, right? So obviously like what you just said, chair members will also have to be committee members currently because there are only 10 of us. Um, and so it just made sense to me that we look at it and, and, and agree to be involved in committee, kind of have crossover with our current chair position. So for me, I thought about if I'm product um, development and packaging development uh, chairperson, then I should be communicating with Noah, who's involved with sales, because he can kind of help me to understand what's, what's plausible. Um, and then at the same time, I should be meeting with Mark because if I'm developing a product for SOFF that's a packaging scheme, then I'm going to want to talk to Mark about um, how that looks, how that will appeal to people. And then also it would be Mark who's going to kind of promote those new products. Um, so then at the same time, then it, it just makes sense for me to be on Mark's chair or excuse me, on Mark's committee, as well as on Noah's committee so that I can gain information from them. And then also that way, when we have this meeting, we just get it all done. Whatever Mark has, wants to address gets addressed and, and so on. So that was just my thinking there. And then it, uh, um, without looking at the list, I couldn't say what the other ones would be, but there's a lot of crossover between these. And so it just made sense in that way to me. Okay, right on. So um, why don't we go go ahead and take the time that we have to like kind of maybe we should go through them and talk about what we um, what we see the responsibilities of these committees being. Um, I know that's probably maybe a little bit more than what people who are watching this video or being here expect, um, but it would also be an opportunity for. Um, like Alan, we know you've got you've got an application, and I want to talk to you about that um, sometime soon. I'll probably just hit you up independently, um, and then if we have other other uh, like Adrian's here, he hasn't probably applied to be a farm member at this time, but we can at least introduce the committees to you guys and get an idea of what we want those committees to be responsible for. All right. So is that, does that sound good to everybody if we go forward with that? All right, so um, why don't we go ahead and start with the sales committee. Um, Noah is not here to direct that, but um, he, is, he volunteered to be the sales committee, but I think we could probably, um, you know, kind of be proactive about what we, what we see the sales committee doing. Yeah, I think uh, checking out market data and then He's a big bulk seller, bulk seller. So uh, he's gonna see what the shops um, 
what they're demanding of us. Because uh, when you're selling 50 pound bags, you don't get to really tell them the price unless it's God's gift that you're handing them. But uh, I know that he's normally under us like 50 pounds at a lot of the shops that we're competing at like not competing at, but at the same shop at, uh, just from word of mouth that we've heard. Uh, so I think he's going to be great. And like telling that kind of thing, uh, exactly where he sees that bulk price at and reasons with all of us with it. Um, but yeah, then the market data, but that's what I saw for him. Nice. Yeah, that'd be great to get that, um, that, uh, headset, whatever that is that he has, if we could get that shared with the group, that'd be insane. What do you remember the name of that software? Is it called Headset? Yeah, it's Headset Market Data. Market. It's a subscription service. It's like the best in the nation. Yeah. And then, you know, for we don't have to be farm members in order to be on these committees. So I don't know, Jeremy, if you'd be up for being on a committee, but it seems like the sales committee would be a good one for you when that time comes. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing because I get real input daily from the sales team that's out there getting beat up. Cool. Okay. Um, at some point, we'll have a, uh, some sort of methodology for collecting uh, volunteers to be on these committees. We don't have it yet, but we're going to, we'll, we'll do that. And so then people can then start signing up for committees. Um, do what about like actually reaching out to dispensaries and doing sales like actual sales is that something that the sales committee should be responsible for putting together i mean at least trying to find resources for that kind of initiative i think finding wholesalers is a great uh start that's where we found the most uh movement with not being able to drive up to Portland. Uh, we need to find these little people that can help us and promote our brand, really. Uh, we got Russell uh, working independently with us. He was from the dub, but he's like, no, I love your brand. Like I came to your farm. I love this stuff. Like the whole family, there's like four of you guys. There's not some dude on a gator uh, or like from an indoor facility, whatever. But uh, those guys really like to promote the home like what we have down here in Southern Oregon, people in Portland don't even know this kind of weed really exists because <laughs> we're not marketing it right. And I think once we have the brand and we're actually marketing it and selling it through these things, like people are going to catch on a little bit like, oh, this is the craft cannabis. Like I know some people do, but it's really like being at the conventions, people are like, so what is this? And I'm like, uh, my heart and soul in a jar. Here you go. Mm -hmm. I, I put this nutrients in here that I made like four years ago. Uh, and they're like, oh, this is amazing. You sell it around here? I'm like, no, nope, because no one really buys it except like that guy over there. And it's like a retail loss. <laughs> but I think it's all marketing. And uh, but yeah, it's a uh, yeah. Jeremy, can I ask you a question? So so we have the we have the leaf link menu and we would add the co-op would like to make some money. And one of the ways we talked about making money was to uh, to be able to do like direct to um, dispensary sales through the menu. And then we would charge the farm a small percentage. My question is, do you think a wholesaler like yourself would be, did I put my thumb up? That's weird. Uh, <laughs> I really like what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, uh, uh, could would you like would people like yourself, you in particular, would you be interested in delivering product that was sold through the menu or uh, help help to um, do uh, what is it called when you actually you know, fulfill the orders uh, like fulfillment. Um, that's kind of something we've been talking about. We've been talking about how can we do our own fulfillment potentially. And I, I agree with Mark, it's way easier to just go work with a wholesaler. But at the same time, when we have opportunities to, to make sales and uh, work out fulfillment, is it, is it possible to like kind of have like a mutual relationship with a wholesaler to where the wholesalers could be selling our product and getting that 20% commission? 
but at the same time, there might be sales through our menu that um, the co-op could actually benefit from, from those sales. You sure. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And I believe there are services like that now with different distributions. Um, we are not doing that currently, um, but it's not out of the question. I, th I think there's room for a model like that. Um, my model's a little bit different right now with, with our vendors, we have a brand representative. So each each farm or each brand has their own salesperson that supports the sales team. So it gets their message through my sales team's mouth because really the marketing is everything, right? What are we doing for marketing? How do they know to go on LeafLink and order your product? Well, that's what my salespeople are hired to do is to prospect. They go out door to door, putting that brand in front of their face and showing them, letting them smell it, letting them try it. That's the marketing that the distribution is doing. We get the sale, we get the percentage of the sale, but all the work goes in beforehand, right? Building those relationships. And the dispensaries, what we're finding is, even if they love your product, when it runs out, they don't reorder it. Unless you're there saying, here, you're out, you need more. They'll let somebody else come in and say, oh, you got a spot in your shelf here. Let me take that. Well, you just lost your shelf space if you're not consistent in front of them pushing that product, right? So that method can kind of work. You might make some money, but it's not going to be consistent relationship money. So there's, I'm not going to say no to it by any means. I know other people are doing it. It's just not the model we're after. We're really trying to build up the brands for our partner farms and finding on a distribution side, trying to find the right partner. Like Christina said it a ton of times, she doesn't want to sell and distribute. She wants to grow, right? I don't want to grow. That scares me. There's too much risk in it. I'll take care of the sales <laughs> and go get beat up every day. That's what I enjoy doing. <laughs> so yes, yes and no. I mean, if, if there's something like that, something needs to be driven to Ontario, understand that that's, that's just as much struggle for a distribution as it is the farm. Because of all the limitations, just like we were talking about earlier, you can only have so many pounds on your circular manifest. My, my rep has to drive to Eugene to pick up the order, then drive out to Eastern Oregon. I can't drive it to him, deliver it to his car and have him take it farther, but it's got to stay in the same car is the manifest it's so there, there's struggles there which i was really excited to hear earlier about talking with the olcc and figuring out the circular manifest and and some of the challenges that prevent us from going out there with bigger orders um but to answer your question yes i'm open to listening to a delivery fee um and ideally i would love to take on all you guys but it's not realistic right now i because I've got to do a great job for the farms I do have on my menu. And if I cloud that before I have those relationships and all the dispensaries, I'm not going to do a good enough job for the ones that we already signed up. That's sure. fair. Sure. I understand. Hey, Mark, did you want to uh, chime in? You had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was just the same thing there. Yes and no. That's no. I, we saw both models and uh, the direct person that like actually knows your farm and like reps that is like highly lucrative. We only make a margin of our sales on direct two. Yeah. And that's like, we do have a fulfillment person for that. They're just like a delivery person, uh, but it's like a penny compared to the piles of money that the actual person that knows our farm sells for. Christine. I, I'm thirding what Jeremy said, but um, also we talked about um, getting like hiring, um, soft hiring a farm like liaison. Basically we all know wholesalers or people that we've worked with and we can pick up more. I'm we're talking like Jeremy's my favorite, of course. And I'm talking to a few other ones that will probably be willing to pick up other people from the co-op. And the idea was like, if we get a group like um, sales rep, Mark's using um, Russell from the Dove. I think that maybe another member or two are using him also. Patrick has his sales rep. Brian has somebody personal that he takes out. Scott Langfield had um, Garrett. But if we could pull together and have a farm liaison, like they go in and they kind of grease the wheels, get in the door, but then we use 
our wholesalers as order fulfillment and they just service that account. That's the cheapest effective way to do it. I think it's like getting, I think us, our sales rep could get us in the door at dispensaries and like, hey, they'll like us, but then we have to fulfill that relationship and be a good partner. And we can't realistically do that as farmers. So we have to use partners like Jeremy or the dub or whomever else to, to consistently show up and be there and we can just build those relationships. And that's why working with Jeremy, um, he's working, they have like a whole marketing team. They're promoting my brand and any other brand that they're working with. They're um, tagging us on Instagram. So we know exactly where our weed went. They can contact me directly with any cultivation questions or strain questions, anything like that. And then I have the opportunity to go and follow up and do bud tender training or send a sales rep out there to give them some swag and tell them more about our company. So I think our job could be building like personal relationships with the dispensaries. And then we, we utilize wholesalers that are already doing it to, to maintain those relationships. And I really did Bo. Um, I'm bummed. He's not here, but I loved his idea of kind of like the wholesale cooperative model, like um, because there are wholesales across the state and they can't service efficiently either every single spot. So I don't know how that would work, but we're all of us working together, not being competitive, but just say, keeping the same price, having the same voice and representing the farm and building lasting relationships is going to be what really keeps us in the door. But that was a little long winded. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's reiterating what the, the, what we've been talking about from the beginning of, of the foundation of this co-op is that the farms do need to, we do need to own our uh, relationships as much as possible, just because the experiences that the farms have had with the wholesalers has been abysmal. And, um, and, and there has to be some precautionary efforts that, that are being done. Otherwise, um, you, we leave ourselves being, continue to be susceptible to shenanigan. Again, not you, Jeremy, but everybody else. <laughs> uh, well, no, Jeremy been... worked for a big company. That's one of the yeah, big well, things. Saw, yeah, well, yeah, Jeremy, you saw it. You saw what could Jeremy. go down. Yeah, well, so he it... had a lot. Like he sold his company that he worked for, sold my weed, but they had bad practices themselves and went under, which mm -hmm. left me like, uh, what do I do now? And like just relying on one person who says, I got your back. I know where all the weed is. You don't have to worry about it. And then they fuck up. And then I don't know, like, I, there's, I don't have, I have to start from zero again, but working with somebody like Jeremy, who's working for a more ethical company, got away from Halo, Hush, whatever. And he's building relationships, but he's also giving me, I know who has it, the names of the people that are buying it. I know how to contact them. So if for some reason his company does go under, I have like a distribution list. I don't have to start from zero again. I have relationships and I have my brand's well known. I'm not starting from scratch again. So yeah. it's a lot of effort from everybody. Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. Well, and understand that that's a huge risk that I'm taking, right? I mean, being able to share all that information because it would be super easy for all of a sudden say, oh, I'm already placed in all these dispensaries. I don't need your distribution anymore. I can hire a delivery service, right? I know I'm taking that risk. But I also know that the farms that I work with are taking a risk on me. And a true partnership, we're going to work together and we're going to build each other up and stick together. And I don't have lengthy contracts, anything like that. If it's not working for you, it's not working for me, that's fine. I'm willing to put in the work because I believe in the farms that I've partnered with and they believe in me. Jeremy, if... <clears throat> If you see, you know, if you get an opportunity to see like a whole suite of SOFF product and meet us farmers um, beyond just these meetings, um, is there, do you see it, uh, do you see a scenario where you're going to expand your business, maybe hire more people? Because what I hear from you sounds like the, the clearest path to a successful wholesale. Um and so, and I think that everybody on this meeting would just love to have their weed in your possession. But is there anything we could do to, I don't know, make it more sensible for you, help with storage, help with getting weed to Eugene or wherever it needs to be? 
I, I really need a wholesale in Medford to be able to drop product. I've got one in Portland. I need one in Bend to be for my for the reps to be able to stop and pick up their manifest. I've got three Portland reps, so they don't have to drive to Eugene. So Urban Farms helped me with that. The TSL is letting me use their distribution for drops and pickups. They're partnering with us on that because I support that farm. Um, I, I could use one in Medford and also in Bend. But to answer your question, I, I not only am thinking about it, I have a plan to have three reps in each territory within two years. So, and with that being said, I will take on more farms as I believe we can take care of those farms. Uh, and, I, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of torn on that. I want to have over a hundred strains to choose from, if, you know, for all these dispensaries. But if I have so much, am I going to do a good enough job for Circle D and Southern Oregon Moonshine? That's my concern. I, they sell, I mean, when you stack them up, they do a great job. They, they beat out the competition, but when I have everybody and also I vet the vendors on their practices, their, how they do their metric, how they do their packaging. Do, do they support me on how, what I need to make the dispensaries happy? All of our stuff is on point. They get each package with a package tag. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff that the vendors I've chosen do a great job of. So, I mean, and I'm sure that you guys are doing well also, but we can get to that point. And yes, I plan on being able to distribute for all of you. I just, I don't want to overcommit to anything. Um, thank you.